Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts, and this is my week of reading wrap up where I talk about the books that I read, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially could read next week based on my mood. I have some books to talk about this week, um, some very interesting books. So let me jump right in. The first one is uh, kind of unknown, uh, or at least was unknown to me, uh, and I'm, I'm quite interested in this author. This is A Favorite of the Gods by Sybil Bedford. Look at that cover. This is a reissue from Daunt Publishing. I saw this at Daunt Bookstore and recognized the name because uh, there was a podcast, a uh, Simply Foxed podcast episode that talked about Sybil Bedford, and my interest was piqued uh, based on what they talked, what her life was like, and the the people that she was friends with, and the people who championed her work, including Evelyn Waugh. So I was like, oh, let me let me try and dip my toes into into her writing, and I read this alongside Leo of Leo's Little Book Life. Um, this is an interesting book. Uh, it's the story of three generations, and we really focus on the women most closely. Uh, we have Anna, who is the heiress, uh, the American heiress, who falls in love with a, an Italian prince, and they end up marrying and living in Rome. Uh, they live with, her, with his mother and his three sisters, and uh, it's a very close family. Anna brings the money, he brings the, the title and prestige. Uh, they have two children. They have Costanza and Giorgio. Costanza is the uh, apple of, his, of her father's eye. He just, he adores her. Giorgio came much later and is a more difficult child. Uh, there, there's a rupture in the marriage that that is something that an Italian would shrug off, but Anna cannot abide. And so she breaks up the family and, and takes Costanza with her to London, uh, leaving Giorgio behind. Uh, it, we then see them in this very restless state where Anna is is determined to kind of throw this temper tantrum and she's not going to go into society, but she keeps having visitors and she, she still lives regally in these hotels and they move all the time around London. Uh, Costanza has never really been properly educated, uh, never formally educated. And now she's a young woman who is kind of the toast of the town. Everyone wants to know who the, the attractive young woman is who is both uh, the daughter of an heiress and a prince, an Italian princess. And so she uh, really is enjoying this, this kind of carefree life that her mother just, just kind of sho shoves her out into. Uh, and then World War I breaks out. Uh, it's very much the story of this specific family, but within the context of this strange time where everything is changing quickly. And these characters really lack a, a center. So they're constantly restless. They're constantly looking for, for things and um, society and culture and people. Um, and it's interesting, the there's a lot of uh, high drama, uh, almost soap, soap opera-y histrionics that, that is found in here. It was published in 1963, but it reads like, a, like an earlier novel. There's not a lot of interiority. All of the things that we understand about these characters happen through dialogue or their actions. Uh, so it makes for a little bit of a different reading experience. I will say I think it was it was an interesting book. Um, I I liked the mother daughter dynamic in here, but I do think that the the next book that I'll talk about that I'm currently reading might end up being the better of the two. And so if you spend time with either of them, I would suggest the other. But I'll get to more of that later. But so far, suffice it to say, it was an interesting book. I'm glad I read it. And you can't beat a cover like that, right? 
Okay, now let me go to another buddy read that I had. This is with Natalie of A Curious Reader. She and I have been reading Magda Zabo's work and, oh, this one was so, 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 so heartbreaking. This is Isa's Ballad, translated by George Zertes. This is a New York Review of Books classic uh, edition. Uh, this book is so beautiful. It's, dev it's actually devastating. There are four main characters in this book. We have Issa uh, of the title, and she is this very strong-willed woman. She uh, always knows the right thing to do. She's very precise. Um, she's the one that everyone looks to uh, because she seems like such a rock and such an anchor. We have her ex-husband, Antal, uh, who is also a doctor like Isa, uh, and he has left the family. He has abandoned Isa, but he has a deep, deep love for her parents, Eddie and Vince. Vince, when we open the story, Vince is dying, and uh, we see so much of the story through Eddie, who is his wife and Issa's mother. And Issa is taking care of everything behind the scenes. She has made sure that he has the right doctors, that he's um, being taken care of, and everything is, as far as it can be set up, she's doing that. But she's not coming to see him, and she's not there by his bedside. That is reserved for Antal and Eddie. He does pass away, and uh, Issa, in a moment of also taking control and, and um, trying to do the right thing, decides to send her mother away to a spa weekend. Uh, and, and while she's there, she packs everything up and sells the home to Antal, who wanted to buy it. Antal has had a very, very close relationship with Vince and Eddie, and he thinks of them as substitute parents, parents that he never had, and he offered to buy the home. And Issa, thinking that she's doing the right thing, then moves her mother to Budapest, where she lives. And we really have this culture clash, this very difficult, emotionally just gut-churning uh, types of miscommunication and misunderstandings because her mother was a very proud village woman who took care of the family and had her, her community that she was a part of. And she, in, the, in this kind of fog of grief, gets uprooted, displaced, and left in, in Issa's very modern home in the city. Uh, so much of, of this is about them trying to, trying to work together, trying to understand each other, trying to be supportive of each other, but truly not knowing each other at all, not understanding each other. And this book is, is filled with these, these disappointments, um, microaggressions, um, Things that Issa thinks that she's doing right that are so absolutely horrifyingly wrong uh, that strip Eddie of her dignity and her freedom and her, her autonomy. Whereas she's just trying to make life easier for her. She's just trying to make her, her next few years a little easier because she's worked so hard. But in doing so, she stripped her of a title and her role, and um, and Eddie is a little lost. Uh, there's always so much more in a story that Magda Zabo writes than just that. That is kind of like the surface. Magda Zabo goes so deep with detail, so rich in um, place and time and even the, the side characters have amazing backstories and you just want to follow them and see, well, what, what's that person like? Uh, she's magnificent in how she writes. And this book was, was uh, a gut punch over and over and over. Um, but one of those that you know you're in, 
incredible hands because the story that she's delivering is so beautiful, beautifully rendered, albeit painfully, uh, painfully true. So I, I cannot recommend Magda Zabo enough, but this was another remarkable read. And I'm so glad that I'm reading these with Natalie because we just had so much to talk about in each one of our check-ins. And there's one more book called The Fawn that has been translated recently into English. Magda Zabo wrote a lot of books, but not as many are translated yet in English. And so uh, Natalie and I are always looking forward to uh, any news that, that another translation has made itself uh, available into the English language. But uh, just absolutely phenomenal read. Okay, so the next book I wanna talk about is So Serendipitous. I was uh, looking at some in some used bookstores, which is my one of my favorite places in the world. And I was kind of scanning the the new acquisitions that they that had been sold back to this bookstore, and I saw a book that I know is not here out yet here in the United States, and I got very excited. The book is uh, Janice Hallett's next release. This is the mysterious case of the Alberton Angels. So I have a, a spotty history with Janice Hallett. I adored the appeal. Uh, that was the first book I read from her and I couldn't put it down. I was late to a meeting because I had started it in the evening. I read it for as long as I could possibly keep my eyes open. I fell asleep, got up early and started reading it and finished it right at like 10 minutes into a meeting and realized that I was late. <laughs> that never happens. I'm punctual to meetings. Uh, but it was that compelling. It was that interesting. I did not like her second book. I've got it here, but I'm going to be selling it back. And that was the Twyford Code. This didn't work as much for me as the appeal did. So uh, a lot was riding on this. Let me talk a little bit about Janice Hallett's writing. So she's a, a mystery writer, a crime mystery writer, and she employs these kind of device tricks. Uh, so there's always this, um, like you are looking over the shoulder of the per of the narrator. You're in cahoots, you're, you're solving it with them. Uh, you're not this uh, abstracted person, you're right in there with them. And so in the appeal, uh, it, the premise is that uh, these two n young associates at this um, law firm, they've been given the stack of information, um, the stack of evidence. And they are supposed to go through this evidence and go through the trial proceedings and all of the details. And then at the end, conclude and send a report of who they think did it and who they think was convicted. And that will be used as the start of, a, of an appeal. And so you're reading the transcripts, you're reading um, copies of emails, you're reading copies of text messages. Uh, so it's a non-traditional way of telling a story. With the Twyford Code, uh, she employed, uh, there was a man who got out of jail who's looking for his son and he's estranged from his son. And so he's using um, he's using the the recording feature to leave messages for his for his adult son, and that's how he's communicating. And so you're kind of dumped in, and you learn you're hearing these messages as if the son was listening to them. Uh, and then and so you can see that she's got she employs these techniques using different means of telling the story. Uh, with this, so, which I, I find very interesting. Uh, when it works, it works really well for me. And when it doesn't, it really doesn't. So with this one, I was like, okay, I'm gonna give her another shot because the appeal was so fun. So in this one though, I was immediately suspect because there is this kind of um, supernatural cultish piece to it. So I was like, okay, that can either be gothy and fun, or it could be just kind of tearing, carrying those tropes a little too far. 
So I wasn't sure how it was going to go. It turns out I, I enjoyed it very, very much. I think it hit the right balance. In the story, we meet Amanda. Amanda is a writer. She's really struggling with what is she going to write next. And she is kind of pitched by her agent like, hey, there's this true crime, there's this, this imprint and they want to do the specific case um, and have you write the story for the specific case. She's not really sure, but then she asks a little bit more and they said, no, 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 you have to sign up before they tell you what it is because it's that explosive. It's that potentially interesting. So she doesn't have anything better, anything better in line. So she decides that she's going to do it. And she finds out that this is a re-examination of a case that happened 18 years earlier. There was a, a, a cult that thought of themselves as angels, a, uh, angels from, from heaven sent to earth. And they had taken a baby uh, that they said was the devil incarnate. And they were going to have a ritual sacrifice of this child. Uh, and instead, uh, five uh, people ended up getting killed and were laid out in a ritualistic fashion. One of the cult members uh, started to have doubts about what was happening and called the cops. In calling the cops, they, she was whisked uh, to, the, to the hospital. And it was when she was in the hospital, they discovered that she had a baby in a bag. Uh, the baby was alive and immediately whisked away from her and taken into child protective custody. Uh, so the 18 years means that that child in protective custody is now an adult. And the race is on to find this child, to find out what happened, and to kind of go back and replay and make sure that the right people were held accountable for these gruesome deaths. Now, I think if you follow my channel, you know I don't really like grizzly. I don't like terrifying stuff. So this had just the, the right level of intrigue and interest, but at the same time without going really gory or really, really dark. Uh, so Amanda's on the hunt. She's, she's going to figure this out, and she has all of these contacts. So she's reaching out to... Um, people in the police department that she knew. She's reaching out to Child Protective Services people she knew, and she is on this case. They find out there's another imprint that is also on the case, uh, and this man named Oliver that she actually knows personally and has had encounters with earlier in her career when they were first starting off. So there's this tension between Oliver and Amanda, and we have this third character who is the transcriber. So Amanda will be out interviewing people, and then she sends the transcripts to this woman who's doing all of the transcription for her. And so that's how we're receiving the material to, to find out the interviews that Amanda's lining up, the, the text messages she's having with her agent, the text messages that she's having with Oliver. And that's how we put this story together. It was fun. Uh, I, I felt like, okay, Janice, I'm, I'm back with you. You've won me back onto your side. Uh, yeah, I just, I like, I like her style. I, I think the I think the, the cultish aspect added some gothic edge to it um, and it really question, allows you to question human susceptibility. Um, yeah, if you liked the appeal, I think this one might win you back as well. So keep it on your radar for when it comes out in the US. Of course, you can always order it from the UK now. Now let me... Um, share something else that I that I read. I have I've been keeping this because I wanted to to wait for the right time to read it. This is Yerba Buena by Nina LaCour. Uh, I've heard so many good things about Nina LaCour. One of uh, the women in my in real life book club has really liked her work and and spoke really highly of it. And I've seen this on a lot of lists. And because it's Pride Month, I wanted to read a book that features gay experiences. And so uh, that is what led me to this one. Gorgeous cover, right? Uh, this is the story of these two young women and really their coming of age. They have very different upbringings, very different life experiences. And 
for a long time, uh, it, it wasn't, wasn't really clear how they were going, these two stories were going to intersect. Uh, but each offered really compelling, interesting characters and stories in and of themselves. And so it almost felt like two short, two short stories that were kind of then fused together um, at a certain point. We have Sarah. Sarah is from Northern California, a little bit north of here. Uh, and she has run away from home, uh, leaving her younger brother behind. He did not want to come with her. Uh, after the death of her first girlfriend and her first love, she's afraid, she's, she's horrified, and she's dealing with intense, intense grief. And she just knows that it's she can't stay in this little town. So she and her a friend that she just met, who she knows is gay, they arrange to get money for a car. Uh, and the arrangement and how they do it is very, very difficult, um, very sad, um, and shows her desperation. And they make it down. Uh, to a certain down to Bakersfield, down that 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 way, down toward LA, and the car run, runs out of gas, and uh, they are stuck for a while. It becomes very clear to her that uh, that her life could be rooted there and stuck in this town uh, unless she really takes some extraordinary efforts to get herself to LA. Uh, the future is completely unknown. They have absolutely nothing, uh, but she has a survivor instinct in her. And uh, we we just, you root for her. You really feel that she needs to, she's on the cusp of finding herself, but she really has no idea who she is at, um, when, when we first encounter her. Then we flip and we meet Emily. And Emily is, comes from a very stable background. She comes from a mother and father uh, who are very stable. And she's like the, the daughter who's, who kind of is waffling and, and can't really find her, her way in the world. She's still in school, still in college. She won't, she keeps changing her major. She changes her jobs. She's she hasn't really come into her own, even though she probably should have already. And she, but she has a, a love of her family and she has a people pleaser tendency and she just wants to be seen and recognized and, uh, but doesn't know what to do. Uh, I'm, their, their stories intertwine in a beautiful way and they meet each other and, and, uh, and fall in love. And so this is a, a delightful love story, but told in a very slow way, really building characters, really setting the stage for who these people are when they eventually finally meet each other. So I, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was so well done and I'm very glad that I own a copy. Now, uh, books that I'm currently reading. Uh, this is A Compass Error by Sybil Bedford. I think I mentioned this. Uh, as this is kind of known as like the follow-up to uh, uh, Favorite of the Gods. Uh, if you get the uh, NYRB copy that they put out an edition of Civil Bedford's books, these are bound together. I, uh, so far, I'm loving this. I am loving this. This is Flavia's story. And I actually think you can just skip and read flaw, read this one because there's a section of it that does a full recap of A Favorite of the Gods. And it does feel that Sybil Bedford had matured as a writer so much, so much between the writing of the first book and this one. So if you are interested in Sybil Bedford, uh, this is the one to read, I think. I'll have more to talk about this next week when I finish. And I've, I've left my last check-in with Leo, but he hasn't finished yet. And I don't want to spoil anything for him. So next week, I'll talk about this one. Then, believe it or not, I'm making, I'm continuing to make my way through this. You haven't heard me talk about this in a couple couple weeks. Uh, this is Paris Stories by Mavis Gallant. I, 
I'm reading this slowly. As you may know, I'm not really a short story person, but this year has been the year of surprisingly short stories. Reading the Shirley Hazard short stories with the Shirley Hazard group, I'll get to that in a moment, and this as well. There's some in here that I have really, really liked, and then there have been some in here that just kind of haven't worked for me and I didn't really understand why I was reading it. But um, I, I anticipate I'm gonna finish this this week and be able to give a more formal uh, review of, of how this worked for me. So stay tuned. I also am continuing to read this for a class I'm gonna be taking. This is Soul of the Age, The Life, Mind, and World of William Shakespeare by Jonathan Bate. It is so good. It is so readable, so interesting. Um, I'm enjoying it. I just need to really focus on this. I get distracted by all these other books, but I really need to pay more attention to this because my class will be coming up next month and I need to pay it. I need to get it done. And then with the group that I'm reading Shirley Hazard with, we are in the final legs of reading the biography. And this is Shirley Hazard, A Writing Life by Brigitte Ulibas. Brigitte Ulibas is doing a phenomenal job at pulling all of the resources, all of the material about who, who Shirley Hazard was, how her, how her work has reflected uh, her, her history. And we are meeting her husband, and she's even gone into a backstory of understanding who her husband is because he was very important in the New York literary scene, uh, also in Paris. And so that it's it's she's a phenomenal writer. I I think many of us said this Sunday when we checked in that this is a book that you actually probably should read her work first because it helps to enhance the experience that you've already had and to illuminate it. And I think that light won't make sense without that context. Uh, so I think it would do what you do well, but what you get, the richness that you get from having some of the really pivotal scenes play back for you uh, within the context of, of how she's written it is sublime. So that's what I'm currently reading. So that's it. I would love to know, have you read any of these? What were your thoughts? And uh, yeah, I'll look forward to talking to you again next week. I hope you have a great reading week ahead. Bye-bye.